Welcome to EPG Patashala. I am Ravi Kuri Setter, Senior Fellow, Dr. V. S. Vakankar, Archaeological Research Institute in Bhopal. In this presentation, we will be discussing the importance and role of animals in the day to day life of man. And we would like to understand two basic things about human relationship with the animal world. The main objective is to learn how humans have used animals and have had varied interrelations with animals during various stages of cultural changes. The faunal remains that we recover from archaeological excavations are generally composed of animal bones and human bones. Among the animal bones, we have two broad categories. One, animal, one group of animal bones may belong to animals which were domesticated and another group of animal bones may belong to the animals which were hunted. In any case, man and animal have a, a prolonged association right from the earliest um, stages of the Paleolithic. But very regular base, on a regular basis, man-animal relationship became uh, interdependent from the time man became a food producer. Now, those animals which have become part and parcel of human society are generally referred to as um, domesticated animals. And those animals which were hunted um, and then which do not live in the hu man or human environment are called wild animals. It is necessary for us to understand when and where the animals um, that have been domesticated were first uh, identified by human ancestors and who were the first uh, to domesticate uh, animals and whether the domestication occurred in one place or in multiple places or it occurred at one point of time or at different points of time in different regions of the world. And uh, also understand uh, how can we distinguish uh, an animal from a, a domesticated animal from the wild animal. The most common definition of uh, domestication is um, man-animal interaction that makes changes in biological, social and cultural dimensions of both humans and animals. So here, animals which have been domesticated are bred in a controlled environment, unlike the wild animals which are free and uh, uh, they are not under uh, any kind of uh, humanly induced control. Now, when the animal is brought up or bred under controlled environment over a period of time, biological changes occur. And the relationship between man and a particular animals becomes more and more dependent. Animals have played a very, very important role in the subsistence economy of uh, human societies, not only uh, in the past, but also in the present. It has also been ob observed by archaeozoologists that prolonged domestication of animals, particular type of animals, bring about morphological changes in the animal. For example, wild animals have a robust uh, physique and as opposed to very delicate um, uh, physique of the domesticated animals. And they also play a very important role uh, in the day-to-day -day activities of man. There are among the domesticated animals some uh, have a, an important role to play in the uh, food economy while others have important role to play in other uh, economic activities and uh, for example transportation of goods or animals which are called beasts of burden. Uh, when man established uh, trade networks, uh, goods were transported with the help of animals, pack animals, for example cattle, camel, horse, etc. Now, what is a domestic animal? Domestic animal is dependent on humans for its shelter, food, water and care in general. Wild animal is an animal which lives in nature, not given shelter by humans, that gets its own food and water and one that is not under human control or care. Feral animal, an animal in a wild or uncontrolled state, especially after escaping from captivity or domestication. Captive animal, an animal being in a state of confinement or imprisonment, example zoo or a circus. Tame animal, 
uh, is not a dangerous animal, dangerous to humans, mild, undisciplined animal. Example, tamed elephants. Now, these are the broad categories uh, that we have uh, uh, made in, in classifying animals which have come um, into human interaction over a period of time. Now, domestication uh, does not take place in one single way. There are multi -ways, multiple ways in which human and animal interaction can grow over a period of time. So, archaeozoologists have identified several pathways which explain the way in which human and animal interaction became more and more interdependent. In this particular slide, we find that uh, there are three broad uh, pathways that have been identified which may lead to increasing interdependence between humans and animals. The first one is commensal pathway, where uh, animals, you know, have uh, a, a partnership relationship between uh, human uh, populations and then that leads to direct breeding. For example, uh, dog and then uh, pig and chicken. Now, prey pathway, here the prey means an animal which, is, which, is, which was hunted and so on and so forth for some time, but later on it gets into human environment and becomes dependent on um, human care and control. For example, you have uh, varieties of uh, cattle and uh, buffalo and these were the animals which were um, very easily uh, available for human um, interaction in the natural environment and over a period of time this particular prey pathway because these were the animals which constituted an important segment of human diet. So, is this particular dependence on uh, the animal meat gradually gave rise to uh, keeping them under their control. This is called prey pathway. Now, directed pathway, it is prey as well as competitor. It leads to human control and also leads to further direct breeding. There are examples such as horse, varieties of horse, ass, camel and so on and so forth. Why not all animals were domesticated by man? This can be understood from the perspective of four or five points that are outlined here. For example, why so few animals could be domesticated is because they should be hardy, the young animal should survive removal from its mother, they should have an inborn liking for humans, they should be comfort living, they should be useful to humans and they should be easy to tend. When it comes to understanding these aspects, very important among them is that their usefulness to humans. And these animals which were domesticated served multiple purposes and some animals which were domesticated uh, began to be much more uh, supportive than some other animals. For example, cattle, uh, sheep and goat. While they are living, they produce wool, they produce milk and while they are dead, they produce adequate amount of meat. So, their on a regular basis, their uh, yield uh, gave rise to uh, surplus availability of some of these animal products that also facilitated in increasing um, the economic pro prosperity of the people who had domesticated these or such animals. Major questions on the origin of domestic animals. Where were they domesticated? When and how long ago that it means? Which is the earliest domesticated animal uh, we have in the archaeological record? What species were they domesticated from? Did it happen separately or in multiple places or at different times? How did it happen? Now, there are two approaches to understanding uh, the human-animal relationship. One is based on recovering faunal, animal fauna from archaeological context. Another is undertaking molecular studies, especially DNA studies. These two um, areas have been um, developing uh, in, the, uh, in the field of archaeological reconstructions of human um, um, economic development since the time of uh, agricultural revolution. For example, we have several varieties of dog or what we call breeds of dog. This particular side slide gives you an idea of different varieties of dogs that are popular amongst humans. Now, where, what is the relationship of this dog with uh, similar looking animals, for example, wolf? Both 
dog and wolf belong to the same family. But then while dog is domesticated, it has undergone morphological changes, whereas wolf, which was not domesticated, has retained its wild characteristics. These are some of the examples of wild um, wolf or otherwise known as canis lupus technically. Genetic studies show that wolves and dogs share at least 98% of their DNA. Cats are also very common domestic animals that we know, but they are not so useful to humans like dogs or other animals like sheep, goat and cattle. But cats also have their genetic relationship with many other wild animals such as um, European wild cat and African wild cat. So although cat is not one of the major domesticated animals, we have archaeological record which helps us reconstruct the history of domestication of cattle. Here the cat goddess worshipped in ancient in Egypt is one of the examples we have. That Evidence has come from the site called Bastet, going back to about 4,500 years. Cat mummies are also found, especially in the area of uh, Bubastis in Nile Delta. Domestic cats likely moved to other parts of Europe as a result of trade. The most popular animals among all domesticated uh, animals is the sheep. And perhaps sheep was uh, the uh, animal which was domesticated after dog came into human interaction. We have varieties of uh, sheep, wild sheep uh, distributed across different parts of the world and uh, the, the first domestication of uh, uh, sheep has been found in Southwest Asia. This slide gives you examples of some of the varieties of sheep that we know uh, uh, through their um, uh, biological study. The earliest archaeological evidence for sheep domestication comes from northeastern Iraq and southeastern Anatolia that can be dated back to 12,000 years ago. So after dog, certainly sheep was the first animal which was domesticated by man. Now this sheep was followed by the domestication of goats. And it is also called poor man's cow because it can adapt to variety of environments. You know, savanna grasslands as well as semi-arid grasslands as well. So they are the ones which can survive on uh, feeding on variety of uh, uh, grasses that occur uh, in different uh, environments. Now here we have these varieties of goats that we know um, from the archaeological record as well as uh, the collection of zoological uh, specimens um, and the study of uh, living uh, distinctive varieties of sheep across the world. These are goat is technically known as Capra agegris. Markhor is Capra falconeri. Ibex is the ancestor or the wild form of uh, domesticated go goat that is Capra ibex. Then we have Spanish ibex and then East Caucasian breed that is Capra cylindricornis. The earliest archaeological evidence of domestic goats comes from Turkey and the Jagros mountains of Iran and Iraq that can be dated to roughly 10,500 to 9,500 years ago. This map gives you an idea of the geographical uh, provenance of uh, a wild goat as well as the region where they were first domesticated. These reasons uh, also suggest the idea that the goat was not or sheep was not um, domesticated on one place. There were at different points of time in the different, re in the different regions of the world uh, these animals came to be domesticated. Now, Anatolia is southern Turkey, Jagros mountain is in the, in the uh, region east of the Mediterranean region which is others also uh, come popularly known as um, the fertile crescent area where the uh, uh, modern countries like Syria, Lebanon, uh, Iran, Iraq and so on, the famous rivers like Tigris and Euphrates flow through and the Jagros mountains were um, the place where even wild uh, varieties of wheat and barley also occur and this, this was the area where we have clear evidence of uh, domestic, very early domestication of sheep and goat as well as wheat and barley. Followed by what is uh, this Jagros mountains and further eastwards uh, into the Indian subcontinent we have the Baluchistan uh, region where we have a site called Mehargar 
which is given as the evidence of earliest domestication of sheep and goat. Cattle plays a very, very important role in the economy of human societies living in any part of the world. We all know its day-to-day -day use as well. And we also know from archaeological uh, instances where uh, the cattle, particularly the bull, uh, was a symbol of fertility as well as a cult animal. Here we see that um, uh, cattle performing uh, their role in the agricultural activity as well as as traction animals where their bullock carts became very, very important for transportation of goods overland from one part of the um, culture area to another part of the culture area as well as beyond. Boss Indicus and Boss Taurus are two distinctive varieties of cattle we know in the archaeological record. Boss Indicus is definitely, as the name indicates, is of Indian origin and Boss Taurus is another variety which occurs outside India but most commonly found in Africa. Boss, in Boss Indicus differs from Boss Taurus in terms of the presence of a prominent hump and the, the characteristic horns um, they have. So Boss Indicus has a very prominent uh, hump as well as very prominent or elongated uh, horns. Um, long horns uh, and hump are distinctive features of uh, Boss Indicus. Whereas in the context of um, uh, Boss Taurus, these two are missing. Jebu cattle are characterized by prominent hump, long face, usually steep upright horns and a dewlap. The taurine cattle predominates the temperate lands of Europe, West Africa, the Americas and Northern Asia. Jebu cattle on the other hand are found in the hot arid and semi-arid regions of South Asia and Africa. It is no exaggeration to say that Boss Indicus played an important role in the shaping of civilizations mainly through the innovation of milking and the land cultivation using the plow. Aurochs are ancestral cattle. They don't survive today. They are extinct. So it has been suggested by archaeozoologists that uh, all living modern uh, cattle uh, varieties or breeds are, are descendants of this particular Aurochs. These Aurochs range from the west coast of uh, the Pacific through Asia and Europe to the eastern coastlines of the Atlantic Ocean and from the, the northern tundra southwards into India and North Africa. In the history of domestication of cattle, uh, archaeozoologists have identified three important events. One is domestication of cattle in uh, Africa, in North Africa and Southwest Asia around 10,500 years ago. Another is Indian cattle domestication that occurred in the northwestern part of the subcontinent and then in China where we have evidence of uh, cattle domestication taking place around 10,600 years ago. In addition to these three broad geographical areas where the earliest evidence for domestication of cattle has been found, within the Indian subcontinent we have three or four centers where possible independent domestication of cattle might have occurred particularly in the context of uh, emergence of Neolithic cultures. In the Southern Neolithic, in the Central Indian Neolithic and in uh, Western Indian uh, Neolithic context, there are cattle bones which do represent independent uh, um, domestication processes leading to their uh, uh, interaction, prolonged interaction with human societies who in the incipient stages of uh, agricultural economy. Next to the cattle, we have buffalo playing an important role in the subsistence economy of human societies. Though cattle and this particular animal enters uh, um, uh, human um, society little later than um, the Neolithic period. We have evidence of uh, uh, domestication of cattle coming from the Bronze Age civilization of uh, the Indus Valley. There are so many re representations uh, on the surface of pottery and on seals, uh, the existence of this animal amongst the Bronze Age uh, communities of the greater Indus Valley. Now we have two or three varieties of buffalo which are commonly found in the archaeological record. One is swamp buffalo, popularly known as Southeast Asia and China, seen in Southeast Asia and China. Water buffalo, Indian subcontinent, West Asia and the Mediterranean region. 
and wild water buffalo that is Bubalus arni and uh, the Indian wild buffalo is considered to be the progenitor of all breeds of uh, domestic buffaloes. The Indian wild buffalo was once, once common across the Indian subcontinent. Pig is another animal which has played an important role in the subsistence economy of human societies and its domestication has been um, very well documented in, from the archaeological context. In India, there is uh, evidence for both wild pig as well as domesticated pig. Domestic pigs are all descended from one common species, the wild boar, Sus scrofa. This is still a relatively common animal found in many countries throughout Europe, Asia and North Africa. This wide geographical distribution of wild boar has presented a special challenge to those interested in identifying the initial sites of pig domestication. Horse has also played a very important role and uh, the presence or absence of horse in the archaeological record has also been an important issue, particularly in the context of understanding the decline of the Indus civilization as a result of uh, invasion by the Aryans who were horse riders. So, most archaeologists are very keen on establishing the antiquity of domestication of horse in India and they are very, very keen that they have uh, uh, evidence of horse bones either in the um, context of Bronze Age civilization or even earlier. The questions when, where and why horses were first domesticated are still uh, topics of hot debate. We have these uh, couple of varieties of horse as shown in this particular illustration. Now wild ass and horse, um, they seem to have a common ancestor and the duties these animals perform is very obvious from the slides that are on display here. In the megalithic context, uh, the presence or absence of um, horse can be made out by their, either by direct evidence of the uh, faunal remains of the horse or indirect uh, evidence in the form of various types of uh, um, uh, objects relating to um, ornaments of um, horse and horse riding equipments. In the context of megalithic culture of Vidarbha in central India, we have very clear evidence in the megalithic context, various types of uh, uh, objects of uh, uh, ornaments uh, related to horse which have been documented. Then in arid environments, we have another, uh, you know, uh, heavy duty animal, camel. And the camel is also known as the ship of the desert. Means uh, it can survive in very harsh arid environments for several hours and uh, also transport uh, goods to long distances, not only goods, but also help humans movement across the deserts as well. We have evidence of camels coming from Bactriana, this is a two-humped camel used in Baluchistan, that is Sistan area and in Central Asia, Anau culture. And dormitory camels is domesticated in Arabia, used since 3rd and 2nd millennium BC, but not in the Indus Valley. Two-humped camel, which are common in Central Asia, go back to 3rd millennium BC. One-humped camel, common in Southern Arabian Peninsula, towards the end of the 2nd millennium BC. Northern Africa, parts of East Africa and Asia are uh, as far as East Asia and India, these varieties of camels are found. Archaeologically, the earliest evidence for domestication come from the site of Sari Sokta in central Iran, where clay vessels containing camel dung and cloth woven from a combination of camel and sheep hair were recovered. The site can be dated to approximately 2600 BCE. In summary, we can say that various definitions of domestications are available in the literature. But essentially, there are two ways in, uh, for defining a domestic animal. The first is based on biological aspect, while the second refers to animal in social and cultural context of human societies. Also, the theories of domestication of animals have both biological and cultural sites since both animal and humans have to adjust to each other in constant um, changing cultural complexity of human society. Both of these definitions are mainly related to human control over animals uh, 
animal mobility and of the reproduction. So this particular quadrant we have uh, tried to highlight the importance of animals in the economy of human societies and that we have also tried to identify when and where distinctive types of animals which have been domesticated were first domesticated and the role they played in the um, um, economy of these societies particularly those animals which were not primary source of food and those animals which were primarily helpful in organizing trade and so on have been identified. Animals like cattle performed both purposes. They also were a source of support in terms of uh, regular availability of uh, uh, meat as well as uh, their uh, ability to perform um, in agricultural operations as well. Animals such as ass, horse, camel, they were basically beasts of burden. Long distance trade could be undertaken because of the power these animals possessed. Ability of these animals to remain in a harsher environments was an important factor. Horse could, um, introduction of horse into human, in human society was a revolutionary step because horses uh, could move uh, from place to place much faster than other animals as well. And domesticated animals um, are very, very uh, important because on a regular basis, the, the, their daily yield of uh, products also played a very important role in the subsistence economy as well as the generation of surplus both agriculturally and otherwise. If you um, go through this uh, particular presentation together with the e-text, your understanding of uh, the intricacies um, of uh, domestication processes will also be clearer to you. Thank you.